This is a good news story, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, to secure the future of the National Symph Symphony Orchestra when, uh, for a period, its future existence was, for a while, imperiled. And uh, I think that it is very, very positive um, that that's now being put on a statutory uh, framework, obviously having been uh, done earlier this year, the transfer. Uh, I think it's very, very positive <clears throat> and for it to be matched with some additional money uh, to, uh, to reinforce that uh, and to try and um, uh, strengthen and bring up to full strength uh, the orchestra is a very positive development. So I commend the Minister uh, for that. And uh, the, uh, I think the National Concert Hall is obviously uh, a very good home for the, uh, for the National Symphony Orchestra and uh, the choirs, the Philharmonic Choir, uh, the Corn and Oak, uh, and the Cor Lynn. Uh, so all of that is, is very, very positive. Um, but I do think it is also worth uh, pondering on some of the lessons of, uh, if, like the difficult period that the, the National Symphony, Symphony Orchestra went through and where you know, they had to fight, essentially, uh, for their existence. Um, and uh, I don't want to claim huge knowledge of it, but I was obviously aware of, of the campaign when they were worried about uh, their existence. And I would refer the Minister to a very good article I've uh, read uh, in preparation for this uh, debate, which she may have read herself, but I would certainly think it's well worth reading, by Adrian Smith. He was a lecturer in uh, musicology at TU Dublin Conservatoire. Uh, and it's very good, uh, it's a very good article. And it, he says a number of things which I think should have a bearing on the minister's sort of uh, attitude around this issue. And hopefully have, and in some of the things that she said in her speech, I think she's aware of at least some of these uh, issues. Uh, the RTE have said they have mixed emotions about the transfer. Uh, Adrian uh, Murphy suggests, uh, or Adrian Smith, sorry, it's not Adrian Murphy, Adrian Smith, suggests that maybe that's not quite the full truth uh, in that the problem was that RTE saw the symphony orchestra as a burden, as a financial burden, uh, and that that uh, was uh, a problem, uh, and obviously that's because of, if you like, the financial pressures that RTE may feel, and that that resulted in uh, the orchestra being under strength, uh, not having a main conductor, I think, for quite a while, uh, and when the, when the orchestra, the RTE Philharmonic, as I think it was originally called, <clears throat> uh, was set up, uh, it had 62 uh, members of the orchestra. Uh, that went up in the heyday of the National Symphony Orchestra up to, uh, to 89, uh, but uh, is still, even though there's been some improvement, uh, 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 he, now this article was written earlier this year, suggested it was only at about 72. So it was still well short of uh, the numbers that it needed uh, and that it had at its height. Uh, in what he describes as the golden era of uh, the National Symphony, uh, the National Symphony Orchestra, uh, in in the early 1990s, uh, which then took a major hit, essentially, along with austerity, uh, and that the as the arts did took a, a hammering during the austerity uh, period, uh, and the National Symphony Orchestra felt uh, the impact of that with considerable reduction in numbers to a point that the complement, and he is arguing that unless we get it back up to the numbers that it had in its heyday, is still below what is required to perform the full repertoire of classical uh, programming. And the lack of numbers then led to an over-reliance on freelance uh, or casual performers uh, performing, where uh, the full-time uh, performers didn't know from week to week or from month to month, if you like, who they're performing with. And that this was 
seriously undermining of morale uh, for, uh, for those in the orchestra and that it undermined the conditions that you need for creativity. Um, uh, now I think that's, uh, that's a very, very important insight. Uh, that if you have what we are now rightly seeing as something that is a national cultural institution, a vital part of our heritage, the custodian, I think to use uh, the language of uh, Maura McGrath, the chairperson of the National Concert, Ho Concert Hall, the custodian of Ireland's musical heritage. That's, that's a very important thing, to be the custodian of Ireland's musical heritage. Uh, so in that, in that important role, we have to really value uh, that institution and we have to value the performers. Uh, we have to ensure that they are paid properly, as uh, Deputy Yorkowski said, uh, maybe not, uh, they're not in it to get rich, but they do need to live. Uh, and we can't have a situation where uh, vital parts of our national cultural institutions, in this case our musical uh, heritage, are in very precarious situations. Uh, or where some of those involved in the National Symphony Orchestra are in precarious situations, operating to their detriment, but also operating to the detriment of those who maybe are full-time, but also to the cohesion, uh, and therefore, if you like, the, uh, the conditions that lend themselves to creativity, which is what this is, all this is about, uh, are being undermined. Uh, so, I know the Minister referred to the extra, uh, wanting to get the orchestra back up to strength and providing the additional 8 million to do so, but I think it is critically important that we're engaging with the performers to make sure that is actually the case, okay? That we get it up to the strength that it needs, uh, that that is secure into the future, and that we don't have an over-reliance on people operating on a freelance or casual uh, basis where there's a turnover and so on uh, of people which is undermining the cohesion and the creativity of the National Symphony, uh, the Symphony uh, Orchestra. Um, uh, I also uh, think that uh, Adrian's article goes on to say that there are certain things that uh, should be done now that we've made this positive move uh, that the orchestra needs to build a new sense of identity uh, he, he suggests that it should be given its own website uh, uh, in order to uh, essentially project its identity out there. And, you know, this also relates to the, the changes that have happened in the National Concert Hall itself, the positive changes that have happened over recent years. As he puts it in the article, there was a time, and maybe that still lingers, around the National Concert Hall where it may have been seen as a little bit snooty, a little bit sort of, you know, uh, up there. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that is a perception that we need to work to undermine. I think the National Concert Hall has. I have to confess to my, to my shame that it was only about, I think it was only about eight or nine years ago, I first w walked into the National Concert Hall to see Martin Hayes. Uh, and I was, fab you know, incredibly impressed. Uh, obviously, Martin Hayes is brilliant. Uh, but that they have worked, uh, they have worked to sort of overcome that, perception, but of course, uh, and I think are very committed to doing so, uh, and to showcasing not just classical music, but also contemporary music, but they ha uh, and projecting themselves outwards, and, and in this case the, the symphony orchestra and the choirs, projecting outwards that they exist, that they're there for everybody, uh, and that the concert hall and what they do is for everybody. But you need resources to do that. Uh, and they should be given uh, those uh, resources to develop uh, their audience uh, and to ensure that as well as the classical repertoire uh, that we are also constantly nurturing new contemporary uh, music uh, uh, and ensuring it gets its opportunity for exposure. And as I think, as others have mentioned then, that kind of follow one thing follows from the other, is the whole question of outreach, uh, of, of reaching out beyond the physical limits of the building uh, to project out what goes on in the National Concert Hall, what the, Sym what the symphony orchestra and the various choirs do, projecting those things out to communities 
uh, and parts of the country that don't often get exposed to those things. And again, that requires uh, resources and support, uh, uh, but I think they are vitally important, uh, they are vitally important uh, things. So this is a good news story. It's very, very positive, but beware of the lessons, if you like. For a moment, there was a real possibility we might have a National Symphony Orchestra, right? Uh, so let's remember that these dangers exist. If uh, art and culture and music are seen as financial burdens rather than absolutely integral parts of what our society is about, about our identity, uh, about the cohesion of our society, about what's truly valuable uh, uh, and, worth, and worthwhile. Um, and finally, in that regard, I would just say, you know, let's also then extend out the lesson that we have learned from this episode, and in this case, from the sort of positive final result for the National Symphony uh, Orchestra to other areas of culture and heritage. Uh, and uh, I said this during the budget debate, um, and I don't know if the Minister will have a chance to respond, but the, if you take other musicians and performers, not within, the, uh, within the, the NCH or the symphony orchestra, they were extremely disappointed with the budget. And uh, the minister may be aware of this. The uh, MEAI group, who are part of a cross-party group, they meeting regularly here in the Dáil, campaigning for certain things prior to the budget, were extraordinarily disappointed with the budget. I noted in my budget speech uh, on the day of the budget that your, the overall budget for arts and culture is down by 5% this year, according to the estimates book, uh, at least, and that the overall budget for your department is down by 8%. Uh, so while we have a good news story here, we have cuts elsewhere, and specifically a 5% cut in arts and culture. Now that's both disappointing, but it also flies in the face of previous commitments by the last government, I presume commitments that this government would, e would equally have been committed to, namely to, on a year-on-year -year basis, increase the proportion of uh, government spending that's going into the area of arts and culture. In fact, uh, I think the, the 216 to 220 government committed to double it and to move towards the 0.6% of GDP. So it flies in the face of that that we have seen a cut in this year's budget, in the overall level of, exp uh, of expenditure in arts and culture, and at least one group that are very, very disappointed in this regard uh, are those jobbing musicians and performers represented by groups like MEAI, uh, who tell me, again, I'd be interested to hear the Minister's response to this, that the funding that had been provided during COVID to local authorities to subsidise gigs and performances by musicians who were hit by the COVID pandemic has now, ha, has now been uh, withdrawn. And while everybody is glad to see the additional money, for example, going to the Arts Council and to the funded sector, uh, that there was absolutely zero for the unfunded sector. And when we say the unfunded sector, we're particularly talking about the individual musicians and artists and performers who, as we know, struggle to survive. Uh, who often live quite an episodic and precarious existence, but just like the musicians in the symphony orchestra deserve our support uh, and uh, uh, do what they do primarily because they love doing it. Uh, and they are also a vital part of our musical uh, heritage, but they did not get the support, and in fact appear to have lost some of the support that they had received during COVID uh, in, the, uh, in the recent, uh, in the recent uh, budget. Uh, so, you know, as welcome as this uh, transfer of the symphony orchestra to the NCH is, and the commitment that the minister is clearly showing to the symphony orchestra and to the NCH, uh, we need that uh, commitment and support to go to all of those who contribute to what is a, you know, a fantastic musical heritage, uh, a fantastic uh, you know, uh, array and cohort of musicians and performers, many of whom really struggle. Uh, so I, 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 I think the, the, the government should rethink uh, their support uh, for those jobbing uh, musicians. Lastly, I just want to say but I also think uh, the same sort of idea 
that underpins the minister's decision to support the National Symphony Orchestra, to give it a home, a stable, secure home in the National Concert Hall, and for, uh, as Deputy O'Connor said, to recognise that uh, although they don't make a fortune, that it should be a career. Okay, that being a musician with all the skill that is involved in it should be seen and supported as a, as a viable career. Now, I would like that same logic to be expen extended to other areas of uh, arts and cultural endeavour. Uh, and I don't know if the Minister had a chance to look at the discussions at my own committee, the Budget Scrutiny Committee, yesterday, where we had representatives of equity, those who represent actors and performers, and we had representatives of film crew from the Irish Film Workers Association, uh, where they came in and both said that despite very, very significant amounts of money going in, approximately 100 million euro a year in the film tax credit, and I don't know what the figure is at the moment from Screen Ireland, but probably 20, 30, 40 million a year, whatever it is, going in, that uh, this is not translating into the requirements for security and for the proper vindication of rights and conditions for those uh, who work either as performers or behind the camera uh, in the Irish, in the Irish uh, film industry. And really some of what they said was should send alarm bells ringing, quite honestly, Minister, and you know I've raised these issues uh, repeatedly. But equity said, essentially, the law is not being complied with in terms of the copyright and intellectual property rights of artists and performers, and pointed out that this is the main, uh, if you like, thing that they produce as actors and performers, is that intellectual property, or the, or the films and so on, and that this is being exploited by film producers who benefit from public money through Section 481, but that those performers are forced to sign, effectively, buy out contracts where they lose entitlement to the residual payments for their own performances. Uh, something that they used to enjoy, but now have lost. And I asked directly to Equity, I said, what happens if an actor or performer wants to get on a film and they are asked to sign by a film producer, I repeat, in receipt of public money, okay, where that public money is supposed to be conditional on quality employment and training, if a performer said, I'm not willing to sign a buyout contract where I lose my right to my residuals, and the equity representatives said, quite simply, you won't get the job. You won't get the job. Now, that is bullying. And I noticed that the minister was at the creative space thing, which is very welcome, by the way, and you stop bullying. But that's film producers bullying performers into signing substandard contracts or not getting work. Uh, and they are very grossly substandard compared to the contracts that actors and performers get in the UK, in North of Ireland, or anywhere else. That's not on. That is just not on. And something needs to be done about it. Uh, and these film producers should be forced to comply with what are European directives, where the European Copyright Directive in this regard says buyout contracts should be the exception, not the rule. In the Irish film industry, they are the rule. And if you're not willing to sign up for them, or worse, if you start to agitate about this situation, you'll be blacklisted. And uh, there is nothing to protect you from being blacklisted. And that was the other allegation that came from the people behind the camera that were there yesterday, who testified to the fact that 40 people who had worked for 20 and 30 years in the film industry have been blacklisted gone out of the industry, having worked on film after film after film, gone, because they asked for, and I really want this relates to what Deputy Okasi said, because they asked for recognition of their service in the industry. In other words, they asked for the film producers to recognise that their job was a career. A career. Right? But the way they, even though the, the funding these film producers get is conditional on them recognising that, they don't. And that every time a film that is produced with public money uh, is over, the clock goes back to zero for everybody. Back to zero. So you could have been 20 years experience, but the next time there's a film produced, 
It's as if you never worked in the film industry at all. We'll take you if you like you, we won't take you if we don't like you. And there is nothing, nothing to protect those workers. Uh, so I ask the Minister to very seriously uh, look into that because it has to stop. We need to protect all and value and respect and show dignity to all our musicians, all our artists, all our crew, uh, all our performers.